Welcome to uh, the beginning of our Advent series called My Grown-Up Christmas List. This is week one. So, what do we want to ask for this Christmas the most? What are we asking for this Christmas the most? Well, I Googled it. I Googled uh, what, what are people asking for this Christmas? Well, I have no idea. So um, here's what Google tells me. This is the, these are the things people are asking for the most this year. Apple AirPods, uh, Dyson Airwrap Curling Iron. Apparently Dyson has gone from vacuums to curling irons. Ariana Grande Perfume, uh, a special kind of Nespresso coffee maker. Peloton Exercise Bike. Here we go, kids. Barbie Dreamhouse playset. Uh, I think this is a big one. Nintendo Switch OLED. Paw Patrol, Lego, and Pokemon sets are all in the, in the top lists. Um, and I don't, this is this isn't this a throwback? The, the Easy Bake Ultimate Oven is is top on the list. So it, what isn't that like cooking stuff with a light bulb? I I guess that's still a thing. And I love the uh, the last one. Like I'm just. I'm glad this is there. A Darth Vader lightsaber. Star Wars is still ruling the universe. In 1990, David Foster wrote a song called My Grown-Up Christmas List. Um, Amy Grant, and uh, I think was one of the first to do it, and many other artists recorded it and made it into a very popular Christmas song. It's a heartfelt song about uh, an adult visiting Santa Claus and asking Santa not for material things for Christmas, but for things that are good things for all of humanity. And so the, the, the list, the grown-up Christmas list in the song is this. No more lives torn apart. Wars would never start. Time would heal the heart. Everyone would have a friend. Right would always win and love would never end. The song acknowledges that as children, we often asked for a lot of things that were just really for ourselves. But as we mature, as we grow up, we realize that it's better to ask for good things for others. And so the song says, as as children, we believed the grandest sight to see was something lovely wrapped beneath the tree. But heaven only knows that packages and bows can never heal a hurting human soul. That's true, isn't it? Hurting human souls cannot be healed by a material gift that can be placed under a Christmas tree. The, the, the things that we normally ask for at Christmas... Um, can amuse us for a while. They can put a smile on our face. They can keep us warm outside. But they can't fix what's wrong inside. They can't heal a a human soul that's hurting. And so, there is something that can. During this Advent season, we're going to be we're going to be exploring what what can provide healing for hurting human souls. We're, the, the readings, we're going to be going through some readings uh, from Isaiah. And the readings from Isaiah suggest a sort of grown-up Christmas list uh, that can provide exactly what our, our hurting human souls need. And so what would, what would God want us to ask for this Christmas? That's really the underlying question um, throughout this, this series, this, this short series, what would God want us to, if, we're, if God was to advise us on a Christmas list, what would God want us to ask for? That's going to be our grown-up Christmas list. What would God want us to ask for? So I, the prophet Isaiah had a sort of a grown-up Christmas list of his own. Isaiah, the prophet Isaiah was God's prophet to bring God's message to God's people. But his job was, and we're studying it on Sunday mornings, his job was very, very difficult um, because the people weren't listening to him. They didn't want to have anything to do with it. And they were messing up terribly in how they were living their lives. And because of that, they, the whole nation of people, were suffering a lot of consequences. 
And when I say that, I don't mean just like a pandemic. I, I mean, they were suffering worse than the stuff that we've had to go through. They, all the nations of the earth were bearing down on them, especially eventually the, the, the ruling nation of the, the earthly power, the worldly power of Assyria was coming down uh, to ultimately wipe out um, the northern kingdom, and then the nation of Babylon would wipe out the southern kingdom. And so they were facing, what they were facing was they were facing annihilation as a result of, the fa- of, of how they were choosing to live and choosing to reject God. And, and, and Isaiah was, Isaiah was the, the God's spokesman to try to talk sense and to try to talk grace into them, to try to share God's message with them. And so here is, here is the first wish on Isaiah's Christmas list. It's how our text starts out, where he calls out to the Lord and says, Oh, that you would rend the heavens and come down. Oh, that you would rend the heavens and come down. And in such a way that it, he goes on to say that it would make mountains tremble. You know, in such a way that, that no one can miss it. So he's saying, Lord, display your strength. I'm asking you to display your strength in, a, in, a, in such a powerful and unforgettable way, the kind that would move mountains to deliver your people from the enemy as you have done so many times in the past. So we can just, just make that really clear. He's, he's, the, the wish is, come help us. <laughs> he's asking the Lord to come help us. We need help. Come help us. And so if, if I could just kind of give the, the basic points of those nine verses that we read earlier, it's this. Lord, come help us. Come in a powerful way and help us. Lord, you have always, you've always acted. Here's how you're different than every other of those false gods. You have always acted on behalf of those who wait for you. You've always come to the rescue. You've always acted on our behalf. You've always showed up. Show up because you always have. Think about all the ways that the Lord had showed up in ways that made mountains tremble. How how he delivered the people from their slavery in Egypt, their 400-year slavery, in, in that powerful way how he brought that nation out of Egypt. How he then, when, they were, when their backs were against the Red Sea with nowhere to go and Pharaoh's army coming, God parts it. God shows up in a powerful way to deliver his people. When, um, as they wander through the wilderness, God is there as a pillar of fire by night, a pillar of cloud by day to lead them. And powerfully see them through so many difficulties. They get to Jericho. Uh, God, God, first of all, parts the Jordan River so they could go. God crumbles the walls of Jericho that stood against them. God delivered them from enemy after enemy after enemy. All the way through the history, the whole Old Testament is this history of God acting on behalf of those who wait for him. Not those who try to figure out their own way and do their own way, but those who wait for him. But... Isaiah admits in there, we keep messing up, Lord. We don't, I'm asking you to come help us. I'm asking for this deliverance, but I know we've been messing up. We don't deserve it at all. In fact, we, we have become like someone who's unclean in your sight, even, to the point where the, our most righteous acts, the most, the most wonderful things that we could do, look like filthy rags to you, look like something that's disgusting and gross to you. I know that's how far we've come from earning you showing up on our behalf. But Lord, don't be angry. Don't be angry with us. You are our Father. We're the clay. You're the potter. You you made us. We we belong to you. We're, We're yours. You made us. You're our Father. And so it all distills down to this. Do not remember our sins forever. That's verse 9. Do not remember our sins forever. Do not be angry beyond measure, Lord. Do not remember our sins forever. Could you forget about them? (laughs) Could you please not remember our sins? Or we might say it this way. Lord, give us a second chance. Give us a second chance. Could there be a more important Christmas wish than that? Uh, God, forgive us. Give us a second chance. Send your son into the world and into our hearts 
to give us forgiveness, to, to give us a second chance to be your people as you've made us to be. Lord, could you please forget about um, all the times we failed you and lead us to live a new life in your forgiveness? Don't you and I often need a, a second chance? <laughs> I mean, don't, don't we so often need a second chance? Like, like taking a mulligan in golf, you know, like, uh, let me just, let me get another chance to hit that thing. I, w- I wish I could just have that one back. You know, like a quarterback throwing a, a, quarterback throwing a bad pick six. Like, uh, can I, I, if I could only just have that one back, have a second chance, I would not throw it that direction. I would not hit, I would not use that, uh, that driver. I, could I just have a second chance? But, but, it, but with real things in life, how often do we just, oh, could I take that one back? Could I do that one over? Could I have a second chance on that one? That stupid thing that I said. That, that oh, that, that explosion of anger that I just, that, that I lost, that temper I lost, the temper tantrum I had and the way I lost my temper with someone I love. Or that, that decision to just get one more thing done quick, which then end up causing you to miss your, your kid's event. Or, or that, that lie you told that just was going to protect somebody, but it ended up hurting them. How many things don't we wish we could just get a second chance with? Do over. So that's the first item on our grown-up Christmas list, a, a second chance. It's exactly what we need. We, we fail regularly. Okay, we, we need a second chance. That's exactly what we need. And that's exactly what God does. And that, that is what makes God different than anyone in this world, than anything in this world. Uh, verse 4 of our text says, Since ancient times no one has heard, no ear has perceived, no eye has seen any God beside you who acts on behalf of those who wait for him. God is the only one who offers you a second chance in life. A, a little boy was visiting his grandparents' farm, and he was given a, a, a slingshot to go out and play in the woods with. So he went out into the woods, you know, where it'd just be safe, to, to practice with his slingshot and found out he wasn't very good at it. In fact, he was really terrible at it, and he could not hit the target at all, and he kept trying, trying, trying. He couldn't even come close to hitting the target, and finally, he just got a little bit discouraged and frustrated, and, and he came back for dinner. While he was walking back, he saw his grandma's pet duck, and just out of impulse, not trying to hit anything, not thinking he could hit anything, he let that slingshot fly, and when you know it, it he hit the duck square in the head and killed it. He was shocked. He felt awful. He felt terribly guilty. And in kind of a panic, he quickly, he hid the dead duck in the wood pile and turned around only to see his sister watching. Sally had seen the whole thing. But she didn't say anything. Well, the next day, um, after lunch, gra- Grandma said, Sally, let's wash the dishes. But Sally said, well, actually... Johnny said that he wanted to help in the kitchen today. And Johnny just, was, just started to speak up to protest that, but and Sally turns around, looks at him, and says, remember the duck. So Johnny washed the dishes, and Sally went out to play. Later that afternoon, Grandpa came in and, and asked if the kids wanted to go fishing. And, um, and Grandma said, no, uh, I'm sorry, but Sally can't go because she needs to help me um, get supper ready for tonight. But Sally just smiled and said, well, actually, Johnny told me that he wanted to help make supper tonight. And again, she turns around, looks at Johnny, and says, remember the duck. So Sally went fishing, and Johnny stayed and helped. Well, this continued on. This went on for several days. For several days, uh, Johnny ended up doing not only his own chores, but Sally's too. But finally, finally, he couldn't stand it any longer. And so he went up to his grandma, and he confessed that he had killed her duck. Well, grandma bent down and gave him a big hug, and she said, Sweetheart, I know. I was standing at the window. I saw the whole thing. 
But because I love you, I forgave you. I was just wondering how long you were going to let Sally make a slave out of you. Friends, whatever it is that you have done, whatever it is that's in your past, whatever it is that you've done, whatever it is that, that the devil keeps, like the devil like Sally, keeps throwing back in your face, the, the lying, the cheating, the bad debt, the bad habit, the hatred, anger, bitterness, jealousy, whatever it is, you need to know that, that God was standing at the window and he saw the whole thing. You need to know that God has seen your whole life. But here's what God wants you to know. He loves you. And he's forgiven you. And he has acted on your behalf. He sent his son into the world on that first Christmas to give you a clean slate, to do all that was needed to give you a clean slate, a second chance. Forgiveness. And God wants you to know He wants you to know that you are forgiven. He's just wondering how long you're going to let the devil make a slave out of you. But here's the awesome thing about God. When you ask God for forgiveness, he not only forgives you, he also forgets. He forgets. Um... Isaiah's wish is, O Lord, do do not remember our sins forever. Well, here we have this passage in Hebrews that says this, For I will forgive their wickedness and will remember their sins no more. Wow. God doesn't just forgive. He forgets. He erases the board. He destroys the evidence. He deletes the hard drive. He doesn't remember our failures. He doesn't remember our mistakes. He doesn't remember our sins. He forgives. For all the things that he does do, for all the things that he does do, here's the thing that he refuses to do. He refuses to keep a list of all of your wrongs. So he's not like tallying up this list and all of a sudden you're like, "Mm -mm." and all of a sudden he's like, 812, that is just too many times. You're done. And sends the lightning bolt down. God doesn't do that. He's not keeping a list of your wrongs. He's forgetting them. He's, he's choosing not to remember them. He doesn't remember. In fact, um, here we have another description of it. Psalm 103 verse 12 says, As far as the east is from the west, I guess it'd be like this way, as far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. Or Isaiah, same writer we're listening to here, in the first chapter of his book says this, Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they are red as crimson, they shall be like wool. So no, God doesn't remember. But I do. (laughs) You do. We do, right? That stuff we did still bothers us often, doesn't it? Still tortures us, still um, makes our life difficult. That, that terrible lie we told, that, that unfaithfulness, that time we lost our temper, exploded in anger, the time we didn't help out, the, the jealousy we had, the, the, the bad habit, that stuff's still bothers us. And because of that stuff, we, we often find ourselves wondering how, how could God, how could really, how could anyone love us? How could anyone forgive us? How could anyone look past that? And sometimes we wish, we wish we couldn't remember it. We wish we couldn't remember. We wish we could forget it. We, we wish, we hope, we hope for a second chance. So we, we need God to regularly remind us that, that he's given us one. We, this is our wish. This is our list, we, a second chance. But we need God regularly to, to remind us that he has given us a second chance. We, we, need to, we need to know 
We need to know that God is serious about remembering our sins no more. We need to know that he's serious about casting our sins as far as the east is from the west. We need to know that he's serious about making our, the stain of our sin as white as snow. We need, to know that, we need to know that remembering forgiven sins, bringing up sins that have been forgiven in the past and remembering them, goes against God's nature. He doesn't do that. Either he is a God of perfect grace or he isn't God. He's a God of perfect grace, and grace forgets, period. Uh, uh, he who is perfect love cannot hold grudges. Think about if, if God didn't forget, if God didn't forget, how could we pray to him? How could we sing to him? How could we be here to worship him? How could we dare enter his presence knowing that the moment he saw us, he would remember that our pitiful past and all the, the junk in our lives? How could, we, how could we approach the throne of God and enter his presence wearing the rags of our selfishness and greed? We couldn't. We couldn't. But here's the good news. We won't. We won't because we look as pure as snow to him. We look as pure as wool to him. That's another way of saying that he has covered us with Jesus' robe of righteousness. That's a beautiful picture of baptism. The scripture gives us how when we get baptized and, and given faith and strengthen that faith in the forgiveness God has won for us, we get, we get covered in like a robe of righteousness, meaning... God doesn't see our sins anymore. He doesn't remember our sins. He just, he looks at us, he looks at you, and he sees Jesus' holiness. He doesn't see the, the rags that you wore. He doesn't see the, the junk in your life, the ugly stuff. He just sees holiness. He sees perfection. Though, though your sins are like scarlet, they're like wool. They're white as snow. There's no, there's no junk there. He just sees the holiness of Jesus in you and me. That's what Jesus did for us. Again, verse 18, though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they are red as crimson, they shall be like wool. Because Jesus came here on Christmas and stayed through Good Friday and Easter, the stain of our sin has been removed. So we are presumptuous, not when we marvel at God's grace, but when we reject it. We are sacrilegious, not when we, not when we trust in his forgiveness, but when we allow our past to convince us that God doesn't forget. God has forgiven us. He has forgiven us and he has forgotten about it. He has given you and me a second chance. So let that be part of your grown-up Christmas list this year. The second chance that God has given us through Jesus but if it's going to be part of a grown-up Christmas list, part of the description is that we can't just want or ask for this blessing for ourselves, right? So think about this. How great would it be, how great would it be if the whole world would know about the second chance that God has given us through Jesus? How great would it be if all the people in your life that you meet and encounter would through you receive the grace of the forgiveness Jesus has won as you forgive them? How great would it be if, if lives of the people you meet would get changed with the grace and forgiveness and the second chance that Jesus has so freely given you? How awesome would it be if the, if the world through us would know about the second chance of forgiveness through Jesus as we share it, as we witness to it, as we live it, as we forgive others, as we show grace, that, the same grace that we've been given, as we change lives through Jesus with the greatest message in the world, the message of Christmas, the message of peace, the message of the second chance that he's given us, wouldn't it be great? Because not only would a lot more people be in heaven, but also the list in that song that David Foster wrote in 1990 would be a whole lot closer to coming true, especially the last item in that list, that love would never end. When God gives people a second chance, forgiveness, it lasts forever. It doesn't wear out, okay? 
like so many gifts do, it lasts forever. Okay, this love never ends. This Christmas gift lasts an eternity. Will it be on your list this year? Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for the second chance you've given us. We thank you for your grace. That's all Christmas is about. You giving us a gift we didn't deserve. So through us, help us give gifts uh, to people that they don't deserve. Namely, a second chance. Namely, forgiveness. Namely, grace. Because of the grace you've given us. And as that happens, let this world be a place where your love grows and endures forever. In Jesus' name. Amen.